The topics and opinions expressed in the following show are solely those of the hosts and their guests and not those of W4CY Radio, its employees, or affiliates. We make no recommendations or endorsements for radio show programs, services, or products mentioned on air or on our web. No liability, explicit or implied, shall be extended to W4CY Radio or its employees or affiliates. Any questions or comments should be directed to those show hosts. Thank you for choosing W4CY Radio. Are you a songwriter? Are you looking to turn your songwriting passion into a full-time gig? Whether you are just at the start of your songwriting journey or a seasoned industry professional, this show is made for you. Welcome to The Songwriter Show, bringing together songwriting news, interviews, and community. Now, welcome your host, Sorrento. Thank you so much for everyone for tuning in and welcome back to the songwriter show i'm your host sarantos a solo music artist who's been writing lyrics for as long as i can remember i believe words are very important and that's why i'm so thrilled to host this show every single song has a unique story the songwriter show is broadcast live on number one ranked w4cy radio and has listeners in all 206 countries in the world and every state in america the station is also licensed with ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and Sound Exchange, with partnerships throughout the music industry, including iHeartRadio, and exposure to over 300 million listeners. Tonight's guest is Bill Abernathy, and he's going to be with us for the whole show tonight. Bill is a singer-songwriter based out of Kansas City, Missouri. He's been writing music for most of his life, starting in junior high, and of course, all up until today. Along with his music, he has a successful business career with a large international company. He tries to find some balance between these two quite diverse elements of his life. In terms of writing songs, he's a true lyricist first, meaning that he writes the story, the lyric, and then he marries the music to best fit the lyric. Welcome to the show, Bill. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing great, Sorantos. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I want to thank you for being on the show and... Um, you know, basically, uh, we get to talk a little bit and hear a little bit about your story. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I, uh, uh, I've been looking forward to this all day long. Uh, thank you. So, as have I. <laughs> so let's get down to your, you know, I guess your earliest memories. What, what do you remember musically? What's the earliest musical memory you have? Well, when I was a kid, my family uh, was all pretty musical. My, my oldest sister, who's 11 years older than I, uh, was quite involved in church music. I had a brother who was nine years older than I, uh, who has since passed, but he was very involved in the the '60s kind of music, you know, so folk rock, uh, kind of rebellion stuff. And uh, uh, I can remember them playing music and singing around the house. Probably the most uh, vivid memories that I have are the jam sessions that my brother sure. used to hold. Um, at our at our house and have his friends come over and th- those are uh, those are pretty vivid for me. Had a lot of good times, kind of sneaking in and uh, <laughs> watching them play because I was too young to be there and you know it wasn't cool to have a little kid around. But uh, I snuck around and, and got a, got myself involved. I was going to ask you if he let you join in, but uh, sneaking in's good too. Uh, you know, you got to get it where you can. Well, actually, they did uh, eventually let me kind of play along and and. Uh, uh, we had a a really good time. Some of the guys were really, really good players, and uh, they showed me a few tricks. And, and um, I was pretty young uh, when all that was going on, so I was probably around, you know, seven, eight years old. So I got I got started pretty early. Wow, that's great. Bap- wow, starting young, that must be incredible. Baptism by fire, you know, there's nothing like experience, and starting that young is definitely, might have been tough at the time, but it gives you a huge advantage. Yeah, it, it became kind of fun, really, because as, as I got a little bit older, uh, my brother could play, but he couldn't play very well. And and uh, he liked to go out to the clubs, you know, the different clubs and sure. uh, almost the beatnik scene that was happening, you know, in those days. And he got to the to where he would take me with him. And uh, I always considered that he, he kind of kept me around as his chick magnet because, you know, I was a cute little, <laughs> <laughs> I was a cute little kid with curly hair, and I could play a bit and sing a bit. And uh, he'd he'd take me around to all the uh, all the different coffee shops and places, and I'd get to play. And while I was playing, all the the ladies in the audience would go, "Oh, what a cute little kid! Who brought him?" And then, of course, the door was open. So there you go. Yeah, you know, I have curly hair myself, so I uh, I, I get that. 
What do, what instrument do you play? Uh, I play primarily guitars. Uh, okay. I can I can play a bit of keyboards. Uh, a lot of times when I'm writing, and, and I'm struggling with a piece of theory, uh, you know, the math, the sexy part. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'll bust out the old keyboards and, and work through it that way. Uh, but primarily, I'll I'll just a guitar guy. Okay. You know, you started young, and I think that gives you a huge advantage because. I hear about people having stage fright or, you know, they get nervous, but when you're in it so young, it's just second nature to you. You don't even think about it, I'm sure. Yeah, it's not something that I've really struggled with. I don't remember even struggling with it when I was a kid. Um, I think that uh, uh, Art Linkletter probably had the greatest uh, comment ever uh, about stage fright. You know, he he said that uh, everybody gets butterflies. But the successful people are the ones that can make their butterflies fly in formation. Yeah. Uh, I always thought that was a great line. That's so true. And I know that the one thing I've learned, too, when I first started, you think it's all random. But you realize the more you you know practice, the more you plan for every contingency, the more confident you feel out there. And you're not nervous because you've kind of planned for everything. And then, of course, you let spontaneous things happen and you just roll with it. Yeah, I, I think that that's one of the the things that um, a lot of people don't do. Um, you know, I've listened to uh, to some of your music, and and obviously you're you're quite talented and very proficient at what you do. Um, but when I am on stage, the last thing that I want to think about is what chord I'm going to play or what yeah. I'm going to play. That is the last thing in the world. You know, I think that the uh, particularly in the, in the singer songwriter genre, I think the key is to be able to tell the story. And if I'm worrying about what chord or you know what fret I'm supposed to be on or you know whatever you know whatever thing is is being a distraction, I'm really not delivering the story uh, and giving the story its due. And so I'm I'm a bit of a practice freak, and uh, I like to say that there's a there becomes a connection between your brain and your hands, and you shouldn't have to think about it. So yeah. I think you're right. I I can tell you one of the mistakes I made a lot was overthinking. And as you get more experienced and you think less, it's almost like my vocal teacher tells me all the time, you know, your body knows what it wants to do and you just have to let it. Yeah, it's a bit like, uh, I think it's a little bit like sports, actually. I think that uh, yeah. uh, there was an old, my, my kids were both athletes and, and uh, you know, there's an old stay, saying that says that, you know, if, if you practice enough, Right. If you do everything a thousand times, chances are when that opportunity comes into the game or into the performance, right, it will just happen and you don't really even have to think about it. So uh, you have to work hard enough and practice hard enough to put yourself in a situation to get lucky. And uh, I think that's the case. Yeah. So we have our first uh, listener question of the night. How do you get the experience? I think they mean maybe for live shows or. Uh, probably pertaining to you growing up and, you know, your brother dragging you to places. you have an answer for them? Well, I didn't have a choice uh, but to get the experience. So uh, my brother took me around all these places. My sister also uh, got me involved in church music. And uh, I was in a group that traveled all over the Midwest uh, in the summer times uh, and played it at these big youth events and and uh, in all these huge churches, and so I didn't really have a choice but to do it. And uh, uh, you know, I was—I had a guy that uh, I wouldn't say he was a mentor. I, I never really liked the guy, but he did occasionally have a few things to say. And uh, one of the things that he said was, "The people came to see you. It's not like it's anything. They came to see you. You owe them a good performance." And and uh, I think that that's key. You know. You just, sure. yeah, you got to have a, a bit of confidence and maybe be, maybe be a little bit cocky. Uh, that said, I mean, I've, I've not always been that way, right? When I was young, I remember, um, you know, getting a little bit nervous and getting a little bit frightened. Uh, I remember the first time I played a really big show, uh, you know, 15, 20,000 people. And I thought, wow, I'm going to be out here for the next 45 minutes with me and a guitar. This ought to be interesting. Uh, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, uh, as you mentioned earlier, Sorantos, if you're prepared and you're ready and you're practiced up, you just do it. And, yeah. um, you know, it just, it becomes fun. And, and the interaction with the audience, I think is, is the key. Absolutely. Absolutely. 
So you said that you like doing lyrics first. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, how often do you write? Once a week, once a month, or every day? Well, I don't write every day. Um, I don't write to completion that often. Um, okay. But I do write a little bit all the time. So I'm, uh, I, I do what the, you know, the professional songwriters tell you you're not supposed to do. Is I rely, <laughs> <laughs> I rely on inspiration, right? And yeah. so uh, when something happens, I, you know, either to me or to a friend or to, you know something at work or what, whatever, um, you know, I, I'll think about it and I'll go, well, that'd be a cool song, and I'll write a little posty note or something to myself. And uh, then you know, when I when I have a few hours, I'll pull all those out and kind of piece them all together. But uh, uh, I really do. I really am a story first guy, and so I. I really focus on writing the lyric first, um, and and as you're writing the lyric, particularly if you're trying to trying to write a, a, a song lyric as opposed to a poem, right? You, you, there's a, you know, you get a beat going in your head, and uh, you know, out of that comes you know a story that's somewhat in the in the structure of a song, and then from there, uh, whatever the story is about, kind of tells me what the music's supposed to be about, right? So um, even all the way to a key. You know, I, I like to write blues tunes in the key of E, for example. So if the if the song is going to be a bluesy type song, uh, chances are it's going to feel better to me in in that key. Or you know, a rock rock music is typically an A, for example. So um, I, I think that the story and the lyric and and the message that you're trying to to get across really tells you what the music is supposed to be, and the music will should be. Uh, developed to accentuate the lyric yeah and you know the one thing you mentioned i don't think there's any one way to do it what you described to me sounds like how david bowie wrote his songs he'd you know put stuff in little cards mix them all up and uh you know he obviously was a great lyric writer so i think the way you're doing it is fine i think people always like to pretend that they wrote a hit song in like 30 seconds we've all written songs in a minute um, but i think then you have the editing part which is critical um, to make sure the story flows and, you know, you're using imagery and metaphors and things rhyme okay. And so I think the way you're doing it is is great. Yeah, it's just one of those things where you have to be a little bit organized, right? So I, I think chaos turns into organization. So I have, as I'm sure you do, file cabinets full of thoughts and file yeah. cabinets <laughs> full of verses, right, um, that have never been finished and, and uh, uh you know, you, you just have to pull it all out and kind of organize it and go. But, you know, you were talking about that. I was uh, I was having a little flashback moment the other day listening to some uh, Crosby, Stills and Nash. And I was listening to the uh, Graham Nash song, just a song before I go that he wrote on a bet. You know, yeah. they were getting ready to leave a thing and they said, oh, you can't write a song. And he sat down and wrote just a song before I go. I thought it was great. Yeah. Yeah. The. um well, let's see here. We got a couple other fans uh, asking you questions, so let's get to one right now. Is it easy for you to put music to words or the other way around? I think you kind of already answered that, but if you want to answer it uh, quickly. Yeah, again, I always write the words first. Uh, I, I know that a lot of people don't do that, and you know, there's, there's no right or wrong, right? But uh, I always write the words first. Uh, I'm not that guy that's going to come up with a really cool guitar lick and say, hey, that, that's a good lick or that's a good hook for a song. Let's write a song around it. I'm not that guy. Uh, I write the song and then uh, try to match uh, the music as best as I can uh, with the song to really accentuate the lyric in the song and the meaning of the song. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question now. If you could be, if you could jam with any musician, dead or alive, and you can't say me, so excluding me, who would it be? <coughs> oh no, that was my canned answer. Yeah. <laughs> I have to change all my notes. Uh, there's a lot of musicians, uh, you know, over the course of my life that have really had an impact on me, but one stands out. Uh, I am an absolutely huge Dan Fogelberg fan, um, and uh, actually learned how to play. Uh, by ear initially uh, from his very first album that was called Home Free, released it in 1972. And so it's the uh -huh. only album I've ever sat down uh, with keyboards and a guitar and learned how to play start to finish. Um, wow, that's love, impressive. Uh, I love uh, his music. Um, of course, you know, we all know the hits, right? Uh, but he had, a great, he had a great theory about that that I heard in an interview. 
that on each one of his albums he would put a hit because that's what he had to do contractually with the record companies um and they were great songs i mean i i think that his song leader of the band is one of the best songs ever written um but deeper into the albums are are really what i consider to be the best songs so um you know i've covered a few of of his tunes uh, a couple of them on uh, crossing willow creek i, I covered a song uh, of his called Icaressa Sunday, uh, which is an absolutely beautiful song. Uh, but if I ever had a chance to sit down and just have a discussion, whether we picked up a guitar or a piano or sang a note, I would just like to have a discussion on what his process is, uh, writing lyrics and then, and then marrying the music and the lyric together, because I think he just does an outstanding job of it. Okay. So we have another uh, fan question for you. How do you know what key? Do you just feel it? How do you how do you figure that out? Well, I think Toronto that comes back to to uh, you know having a lot of time with your with your instruments, right? Um, yeah. You know, I, I think that each key kind of has its own feel, and uh, it may be because you know I'm limited in, in my skills and my abilities or whatever. But I think each key has its own feel, and and uh, uh, when you know if if you're going to try to write something country. Uh, you want to kind of have that country, you know, CFG thing going on. And uh, so it just kind of slides right in there. So I, I don't know that that it's really there's no mathematical algorithm or decision matrix that you would do to say this is the key. Sometimes change the key because it's too high for you to sing, for example. Sure. Um, but I think that that uh, the music will tell you, you know, if, if you're open and, and you listen. Right. And, uh, you know, it'll tell you. OK. Why don't we, uh, we're going to listen to one of your songs here in a couple of minutes. Uh, tell us a little what the title is and tell us about the inspiration behind it. Well, I, I th- are you going to play the Cry Wolf song? Is that what yeah. you're going to play? Yeah, we'll play the Cry Wolf one first. Okay, so I, I have to I have to tell you this. This is a little bit of a, um, uh, maybe the world has come to be tonight, for example. So Cry Wolf is actually a social statement song. It's not something that I do very regularly, but uh, it is in the fact that we're recording this on the night of the uh, uh, presidential address to the nation it is somewhat of a co- nice coincidence. But uh, uh, the Cry Wolf song, I was actually sitting around. I had had uh, some Achilles surgery. And uh, if you've ever had one of those, it's not pleasant. And uh, uh, so I was I was just sitting around. I had my foot up in the air and taking pain pills. And I was bored. And I was kind of half watching the news and half playing on um, social media. And I just noticed, Sarantos, and I don't know if you've noticed this as well, but how often something gets replicated so quickly on social media that is is – put out on, on uh, the news stations or, or the opinion stations. I don't know that you can tell the difference anymore. Sure. Um, but it was almost instantaneous. And over about an hour of doing this, it just became clear to me that, you know, people are saying these things so often. Nobody's listening anymore. You're not really making a point, you know. Uh, and it, it reminded me of the story of the boy who cried wolf. And uh, it didn't take long, really, to sit down and say, okay, what are they crying wolf about? And so I, I wrote a little political statement uh, in the first verse, and I wrote a little statement about um, uh, what I consider to be corporate churches uh, in the second verse. Uh, and in the third verse, I love science fiction. And uh, I made a, drew an analogy to uh, George Orwell's 1984 uh, book in the in the uh, final verse, but it's uh, it, it's not a, a point your finger uh, because I think we all do this a bit, right? Uh, and I would never point my finger at somebody, but I think it's it's more of a song that says maybe before you hit post, you might want to think this over, you know, yeah. um, and maybe do just a touch of fact checking, you know. So uh, that's really what it's about. It's uh, it's about uh, kind of today's society. And how quickly we tend to uh, post things out on uh, social media that we've really not fact checked very well. So that's why it's called Cry Wolf. All right, that's awesome. All right, we're going to listen to your song and then we'll come back and we'll um, have a bunch more questions for you. So 
Cool. Here we go. Who's Craig and Wolf? You gotta recognize the thieves in your tracks. Who's Craig and Wolf? We gotta separate the lies from the facts. Calling our names loud and clear But we're running with the pack That's turned to death fear We've got to learn Who's crying wolf Think first And the rest will come I turn on the TV And what do I see Elected officials In a broken governmental machine Assuring all the masses they are building this American dream Or spending all the time debating the latest tweets Your tax dollars at work I turn the next channel, I see a smile so bright Spreading the gospel that everything's alright Sending me your money, market 501c3 A deduction for you, and zero taxes for me Hallelujah, yeah, are you your crying wolf You gotta recognize the thieves in their tracks Tell me, are you crying wolf We gotta separate the lies from the facts Turn to death fear We have got to learn Who's crying wolf You post their howls in your media feeds To get a few likes, follows and tweets Like sheep you follow these program elites But they are the wolves and we the wrong Statues hide the flags, hide the wars. But George said it right in 1984. He controls the present, has full control of the past. So we can repeat it, complicit with our alternate facts. Are you freaking kidding me? Are you crying wolf? We gotta recognize the thieves in the tracks. Tell me, are you crying a wolf? We gotta separate the lies from the facts. The truth is calling our names loud and clear. The we're running with the pack, the stuck in death fear. We have got to learn who's crying a wolf. We gotta recognize the thieves in the tracks. Now, welcome this week's special guest. Uh, that was awesome, Bill. We had a little bit of fun <laughs> with that in the studio, just saying. So, yeah. I, I love that last payoff line, man. Just deal with it. Uh, that was awesome. <laughs> well, actually, I had another comment, and, and the, uh, the engineer said, you know, Bill, you probably shouldn't say that. Why don't you just say deal with it? So they convinced me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, the fans love that song. You've gotten a ton of uh, like four or five uh, responses here. I could see the song being done by uh, the Great Review at Universal. Uh, did you make a music video for this? Uh, we did a lyric video. 
Uh, video. And, uh, okay. I've actually been asked about that uh, if, if we wanted to do a real video. And so I've got a meeting uh, in a couple of days uh, with a crew to uh, discuss it. I have a, a bit of a concept about it. So it, it might be fun. We'll see. Yeah, absolutely. I think you should. Um, so a lot of uh, positive vibe. Nice sound here with this one. I mean, a lot of cool. I was going to ask you this at the end, but somebody asks, is there a way to get this music someplace? So do you want to tell us right now about your website, where your distribution is, where they can you know, stream or buy this song, since people kind of want to know? Yeah, um, I've got my website, which is just BillAbernathy.com. Of course, all the music's available at, at all the major players. So iTunes, it's out there. Amazon, it's out there. CD Baby, um, you know, about any other place that you can go. So, um, uh, you know, I, I always uh, ask the, the folks that do promotions for me, if, if you Google Bill Abernathy and I'm not the first five hits you get, I'm going to have a call with some people. So you can find <laughs> You you could find it about anywhere, uh, and then uh, 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 the Cry Wolf lyric video is actually on uh, on YouTube as well. So you can um, you can find it out there. So go get it and listen, and tell me what you think. Uh, so I, I really appreciate it when people leave me notes on my website. I, I get a kick out of that. So wonderful. All right, let's ask you uh, let's ask you some fun questions now. Tell me about your ideal superpower. You know, oddly enough. I was doing a corporate thing not too long ago, and this was one of the questions that they asked me. They said, if you, if you could choose a superpower, what would it be? And it really confounded me, to be <laughs> honest with you. Um, but, you know, I think as a songwriter and as somebody that observes uh, what goes on, invisibility might be kind of cool, you know, to just put yourself yeah. in a situation to watch what's going on and, and uh, you know, see what's really happening in certain situations where, you know, if you were there in person, you know, the situation would change, right? So I, I think invisibility would be kind of a cool thing to be able to do. Yeah, as long as you're not a pervert, though, right? Well, yeah, <laughs> you, you'd have to kind of monitor the whole perv thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah we yeah. don't want you walking into the girls' locker room or something like that. We'd have to report you. Exactly. Yeah. But it could make a good song. <laughs> uh, yeah, actually, yeah. Or the Harry Potter cloak of invisibility. That'd be cool. Exactly, exactly. Okay. A uh, couple more comments here, or questions the fans are asking. Can anyone cover this song? That's a great question. That means they loved it. They want to cover it. Um, sure. What's your answer to that? Sure, sure. Have fun. You know, I, <laughs> okay. co I cover other, other uh, artists' songs quite a bit. You know, I even record them. So, uh, yeah, if you all want to play it, play it. Just do me a favor and let me know you are. I'd got to get a kick out of that. Yeah, that's – you know that there's – I think – when we fantasize about things, everybody fantasizes about hearing the song on the radio, being out somewhere and someone telling you that the song changed your life, and then someone covering your song. I mean, that's so flattering. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the ultimate thing, right? So that's yeah, cool. absolutely. Thank you, whoever that is. Thank you very much. I really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. And a follow-up question. Do they need to contact you to cover? I would say yes, that they should probably email you because I'm sure your manager is going to want to... I'm sure there's some stuff they got to figure out. Um, I'm trying to think. I know for indie artists, there's a place you can get licenses to cover any song, and they take care of all the paperwork for you. But I, I'm drawing a blank on. I think it's on CD Baby's website. Yeah, CD Baby website. So I think it's. Uh, and I like you have now drawn a complete blank. But yeah, I can do yeah. that. So but just if it, it, yeah, yeah. If whoever is reaching out that question, I would just. Uh, they can contact you through your website, and you'll yep. hook them up with your manager, and they'll figure it out. But it's pretty straightforward. You're not uh, you're not like a huge artist like me who wants like a million dollars or something like that. So no, I'm a million and a half. Just yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> so, what do you think about the current situation for songwriters? You know, um, you and I are both songwriters, and we're musicians and performers. But what do you think about someone who just songwrites? You know, the royalties. The new law they passed. What do you think about that? I think it's a tough industry to be in right now uh, because of the availability of everything. You know, everything's digital. Everything's, uh, you know, it, it costs you a lot more to produce the music um, than it really does than it costs you to get it distributed and all that. But uh, uh, I think it's a uh, it's t it's a tough environment. But I also think there's a lot of value out there for for musicians today uh in that there are a lot of places 
that you can get your music heard. I think the key is is to find your your audience, right? To find the niche that yeah. you're in, uh, and then then learn uh, through you know social media, electronic stuff, concerts, and what have you on how to reach out and, and how to really build that audience. Um, for a songwriter only, uh, which I think was your initial question, I don't really know. Um, you know, uh, there's so many songwriting factories and stuff out there now. You know, if you go down to Nashville, everybody's a songwriter, right? And and uh, I, I don't really know how you would do that. I, you would have to be, you know, you write some great songs, you'd have to find a publicist, they'd have to push it, you know, and do all that. Um, or you'd find a really cool, a really cool artist that, that, uh, wanted to record some of your stuff. Maybe that would be an, another way to approach it, but I've never really thought about that. Okay. What were you like in high school, Bill? <laughs> Lost mostly. Uh, <laughs> uh, I always tell everybody the seventies were a little hard on me. So, uh, my high school career was a bit different, uh, probably than most because, uh, from the time that I was a sophomore, I played music, you know, two or three nights a week in, in different places around town. And, uh, you know, so I didn't have a whole lot of time for, uh, you know, I, I, I like to play sports, but I had uh, I blew a knee when my in my freshman year of high school. And so my football career was done. Uh, sure. And I found out I found out that playing the guitar and singing uh, actually was a lot more fun and it didn't hurt. So, um <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I always think of, uh, the John Mayer song, you know, where he says, I never lived the dream of the prom Kings and the drama Queens. I always think the best of me is still hiding up my sleeve. Um, uh, that was kind of me. I didn't really fit, uh, in any group. I was kind of friends with everybody. Um, I had a bunch of friends that, you know, in, in high school, it's all about clicks and, and, um, you know, I had a bunch of friends that were jocks. I had a bunch of friends that were musicians. I had a bunch of friends that were into drama and, you know, some of the academics. And so, uh, I didn't really have a box, uh, that I fit in when I was in high school. And, um, you know, most of my friends that I ran around with outside of high school, save a very few were quite a bit older than me just because of the musician thing. Yeah. And so, you know, my buddies were, you know, eight, nine, ten years older than me. I had a, a very small group of uh, really close friends that were, you know, within a year or two of my age that we went to school with. But uh, most of the people that I hang out with were quite a bit older than me. So high school was an interesting time for me. Okay. So you finish the gig of the century. Everything goes great. You go backstage. Where do you? What do you like dying to eat? What's your like comfort food after a gig that you just pizza, ice cream? What do you what do you really got to have to like release the stress? And so this has happened, right? So in, in, my, <laughs> in my hometown of Independence, Missouri, which is a suburb of Kansas City, there is a hamburger restaurant there called High Boy. OK, okay. And after every big event. Right. Uh, in, in school, you know, whether we all went to the football game or, you know, if there was a show and I had to sing and play or whatever. Right. We would all end up at high boy at the end at, at, after the show. And to this day, to this day, it, when I get back into town from from going someplace, whether it's my real job or whether I've gone someplace to work, that's the first place that I go. I go to high boy. I get the greasiest, nastiest, best tasting, greasy double cheeseburger and a big order of onion rings that you can imagine. And I just enjoy you're making me hungry now, man. <laughs> That's good stuff. I'm here to tell you, man, if you're ever in town. Oh, uh, okay. Um, we're going to get to another fan question in a second, but I'd like to ask everybody about scams. So tell us something that's happened to you. Uh, you know, we want to warn each other. We all want to stick out for each other and help each other. What's a scam that you've fallen prey to or one that you want to warn us about that, um, you know, kind of makes your stomach turn? Well, I think that, you know, we mentioned earlier how easy it is to get your music out there, right? Because mm -hmm. there's millions of places and, and lots of stuff and web shows and, and, you know, all that. But I also think that there are a lot of people that um, they want to prey on your desire to be a musician. And so it, it's pretty easy for them to use some flowery talk and, and some fancy words and, and kind of suck you in on it because of my business stuff that I've done my whole life. Uh, I'm, I don't 
I've not fallen prey to that, save one time. I got involved with some folks for about two days. That was uh, obviously a scam right out of the chute, and I just I didn't believe it initially, but it took me two days to figure it out. Um, but I think there's so many people out there that, uh, that are really wanting to take advantage uh, of what you are trying to do and what you want to be. And, and um, you know, just, just do your time, you know, do your vetting. Uh, check people out. You know, the, the, the Internet's a wonderful thing. You know, you can learn a lot in a little bit of time uh, about just about anybody. And if, if you run across somebody that doesn't really have much of a presence, uh, it's probably a big flag. Yeah. So uh, just, just you know, do your due diligence. Uh, but rest assured that any time that, uh, you know, there's a good product or a good person or a good opportunity for somebody to make money, they want to be involved. And uh, hopefully the folks that get involved are legitimate and, and are there to help. And uh, uh, But other times they won't be. So yeah. take your time and do your homework. You know, there's um, there's a millions of awards and, you know, all that stuff that you can win and you can sign up for and pay me 25 bucks and, you know, whatever. And, and some of that's kind of cool, you know, uh, but just recognize it for what it is and uh, uh, do your due diligence. Okay. So uh, before we get to talking about your uh, second song we're going to play, uh, people are asking again for your contact information, your website, where they can get a hold of you. So do you want to repeat that for us? Yeah. So you can you can catch my website. It's BillAbernathy.com. Uh, I'm also pretty active on Facebook because uh, that, that seems to work in my demographic. Uh, so uh, my Facebook tag is uh, Bill Abernathy Music. And so... I'm also on iTunes uh, under Bill Abernathy and Amazon and, you know, all the other places. So um, one thing I do, though, um, is if you uh, if you get stuff from if you decide you want to buy a CD or download or whatever and you do it from my website, uh, particularly if you buy a hard copy of something, uh, I will, uh, you know, personalize that and and, uh, send it to you. So that's one of my things. I like to stay in touch. And uh, if somebody has taken the time uh, to go to my website and has liked my music enough to, to order a hard copy, then I, I think it's only it's only right that I would take some time and, and personalize that for them. So uh, that's something that I do. I've done that uh, from the very beginning, and it, it I, I enjoy it because it makes me feel like, though it may be somebody in you know Australia, it makes me feel like I'm somewhat in touch. So wonderful, very, yeah. Okay, now tell us uh, in a couple of minutes here, we're going to play your uh, second song. Tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> it's a flashback song. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So Can't Go Back is a song that I wrote uh, a while back. And uh, it really talks about as you get older, you know, you have memories. You know, you did things when you were young. And, you know, we talked about it a bit already. You know, some of the shows that I did when I was young that were really big and all that. Um and you look back on those things and they're really good memories. And sometimes you want to recreate those memories. And um, that I have found can be pretty dangerous. So um, the Can't Go Back song is really talking about some of those things and some of the people that you've met. I mean, you know, I think we all had, you know, that girlfriend when we were in high school or junior high or whatever, you know, and you get an opportunity later in life to, to, uh, uh, reconnect, you know, after long periods of time of not seeing each other. And so, you know, your imagination runs and you go, oh, this, this is going to be great. This is going to be great. And, and, uh, then all of a sudden, you know, you actually do meet and it's, uh, it's not everything that it could be. So, uh, there's actually a line, um, in the can't go back song, uh, that, uh, talks about uh, a hot mess in a red sequin dress. So you'll have to listen for that. Uh, <laughs> But that was uh, that, that's kind of a true story. But uh, uh, it talks about, you know, be good with who you are and, uh, you know, cherish the memories and cherish the things that you've had. But remember, they're, they're memories. They're in the past, right? You're, you're moving today and forward. So um, at the end of the day, man, you can't go back. Yeah, that's wonderful. So before we listen to your song and let you go, um, one last question. What is the name of the CD that's that first song was on? So the uh, the first of so these, both of these songs are actually on 
the newest the newest work that we've done uh, and the album is called crossing willow creek um and uh, uh i'm i'm pretty proud of it M many of the songs i had recorded before and uh did them in a very very acoustic way and uh because that's really my comfort zone right i mean I'm, I'm good with an acoustic guitar and I'm happy, but, um, we kind of took them, produced them up a bit, changed some of the voicings, changed some of the feel of the songs a bit. And, um, uh, the crossing Willow Creek album title actually means my, my first song that I, that I ever got out that, uh, you know, won awards and playtime and, and all that stuff was called Willow Creek. And it's, it's on the album as well. Um, but the Crossing Willow Creek thing is really more of a, a statement that I'm moving out of this pure acoustic comfort zone um, that uh, mo many of these songs were written in and moving into uh, kind of a more of a, you know, produce rock and roll, bluesy, whatever genre you want to call it, um, feel. And so that's why we called it Crossing Willow Creek. Cool. All right. It's been a pleasure having you on the show, and we're going to hear your second song right now. Bill, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Santos, and uh, thank you very much. And, and all the listeners, thank you for the questions. Uh, I enjoyed this tremendously. And uh, again, thanks, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, you're very welcome.
That was wonderful. I want to thank Bill for being our guest tonight, and I want to thank you all for listening. To listeners who may be artists, if you wish to be on The Songwriter Show, I invite you to email us at thesongwritershow.com or email me personally at sorantos at songwritershow.com. Thank you for listening. I hope your own unique story gets heard around the world. My name is Sorantos. Please join us every Tuesday night and hear other amazing artists share their fascinating behind-the-scenes stories right here on The Songwriter Show. And I'm going to leave you with my brand new song that just came out today. Of course, Valentine's Day is coming up in a week and a half here. It's called Kids in Love. And it's the story that I wrote about when I fell in love at the tender age of 19. Have a great night, and I wish you all a very happy Valentine's Day.
Thank you for listening to The Songwriter Show. To keep the momentum going, head over to www.songwritershow.com and join our free music community of artists, songwriters, and producers. That's www.songwritershow.com. 